I was born in a village in Pumalanga. Who ever thought that I'm going to be sitting in a pre with a president in one room? Yeah. Who knows my name? It's, it's crazy like that sometimes because I pause and I think, oh God, this is wild. The fact that a boy from a village who didn't even go to private schools is able to get the opportunities that I've gotten. And I'm so grateful to God for that because I really take it as a blessing. So I do pinch myself sometimes, yeah. you know. Hi, and welcome to the Lead TV podcast. I'm Lennox Wasara, host of the show. We get to speak to alumni from the University of Pretoria. And today my guest is Clement Manyatela. He is on the weekday show on 702 from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. He's also on your television screens on SABC where you host Face the Nation. Before that, Clement Magnatella completed his Bachelor of Arts from our Humanities Faculty. He's also currently doing his uh, postgraduate qualification with our Gibbs Business School. As you know, it's one of the best business schools in Africa. But after a stint at the university, he managed to score a gig with Pretoria News, which then propelled him to success as he later worked with household names such as ENCA, News from Africa, amongst others. I must tell you that he, outside of broadcasting, is quite an avid reader. He's also a marathon runner, having participated in the Comrades. He's also participated in the London Marathon. And he's also a keen golfer. He's managed to find a way to navigate from tea to green seamlessly, getting those eagles, those birdies, and those paws. So Clement, welcome to the show. It's good to see you. It's good to see you. I don't remember the last time I got an eagle. Or even a paw. Uh, but I love golf. I love golf so much. Yeah, how's the, how's the experience with golf? Like, are you getting to play with a lot of the people you interview or um, you kind of using it just to research your brain, have ideas for content? So golf for me just allows me to just refocus myself. I, I also enjoy having conversations on the golf course. Yeah. But it will also humble you. It teaches me <laughs> humility a lot. You get angry on the course and also good judge of character to see how other people behave and things like that. Have you seen so. how some people just <laughs> want to break their clubs? Yeah. yeah. The running now, so if golf does that for you, what does the running do for you? I was never really a fan of running until probably about three years ago when I just decided, oh, let me just start jogging. And then I started jogging. And then a friend of mine invited me to come do the Two Oceans Marathon in Cape Town. I was like, oh, let me check it out. And I did the half marathon. Then I did the trail run the following year. And then I was like, this thing is so cool. Yeah. I enjoy it because for me, it's, it's all about determination. Like when I set my mind, I'm like, I'm going to run 30 Ks, I will get there. I will have challenges along the road, but I'm gonna get there. And that's the determination I have. And I love that about running because I don't quit. I will get to the 42 Ks. I'll get, when I do comrades, I will get to the 86 or the 92, whatever kilometers. And I love that it teaches me a lot about life in other aspects of my life that just set the goal, know that you're gonna be tired, you're gonna be frustrated, you're gonna be happy, you're gonna be comfortable but you're gonna get there. And that's what running does for me. And that determination and that energy, you will certainly hear it and feel it on, on the airwaves when you're yeah. on your show in 702. I've picked up, you have a very cool and calm way of actually holding these people accountable, right? Um, and I think it's something that a lot of people practice in their individual lives. Yeah. And when sometimes, you know, if they don't know you, they're like, but why is Clement asking me all these difficult questions, you know? Yeah. But, but in essence, it's, it's great journalism, firstly. And also, I was wondering where that actually comes from for you. So I have, I've grown in my journalism career. I, I've obviously had different styles of broadcasting, right? Yeah. In the beginning, I was a very harsh guy who brings in the president and is like, you are useless, you failed to do this. <laughs> and I realized later on that that doesn't actually work. Um, a screaming match never works when you're doing interviews. And the kind of show that I do on Radio 702, on the SABC, it's a show about accountability. That's actually what I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about justice and accountability. But there's a way you can do it in a calm manner, asking the tough questions, but still being collegial. Yeah. And that's my style of broadcasting is, I'm gonna be calm, but trust me, I will ask you the tough questions. Uh, whether I played golf with you yesterday, yeah. um, whether we spoke on WhatsApp that early in the morning, you know, whether I think you are one of the best ministers we've ever had, I'm still gonna ask you the question in a calm manner. And I find that when you do that, actually, you benefit more from the conversation because they have, because politicians actually like it when you scream at them and you become too tough on them mm -hmm. because then they can divert. 
then it becomes a screaming match and then they criticize you on why you're speaking to them in a tone that is disrespectful towards them. So to avoid deviations, just be calm, ask the tough questions and that exposes them because they can't deviate anymore. And I find that's actually the style that works for me. Yeah, you've interviewed some prominent uh, figures on your show. You mentioned the US ambassador a few times as well as uh, the former president, uh, President Jacob Zuma, uh, current president, uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa, as well as uh, some other actors, artists, so many other people, Trevor Noah as well. Yeah. So when you, you know, when you go through these experiences, is there certain things that you, you have to pinch yourself and say, wow, I'm actually speaking to the president? Sometimes it's like, you know, life is weird because I, I, mean, I'm, I was born in a village in Pumalanga. Who ever thought that I'm going to be sitting in a pre with a president in one room? Yeah. Who knows my name? It's, it's crazy like that sometimes because I pause and I think, oh God, this is wild. The fact that a boy from a village who didn't even go to private schools is able to get the opportunities that I've gotten. And I'm so grateful to God for that because I really take it as a blessing. So I do pinch myself sometimes. Yeah. You know? Someone said to me, after I interviewed Trevor Noah, I was at the gym and someone came and said, are you Clement? I was like, yeah, I was like, I love your show, but your interview with Trevor, you were giggling the whole time, what's going on? And I was like, that's because one, I'm so proud of Trevor Noah. Yeah. You know, this guy is a South African who is literally doing amazing things, you know, um, in Hollywood and like really globally. But also, um, this is a man who truly inspires me. So I was giggling because one, I was excited, but also Trevor Noah is funny. Trevor was making a joke every time I asked a question. Like he found a way to, there's no way you're not gonna laugh. Yeah, I mean, he's a comedian, you know? <laughs> and then you've got President Cyril Ramaphosa who, I mean, I've covered the president because I've started as a field reporter. You know, I was a political reporter for Eyewitness News. So I used to go everywhere he went. I even traveled with him to India when he was on a state visit. I've traveled with him to Beijing, China, together with other journalists. So, yeah. He's someone that I've come to report on, but there came a point when now I'm doing shows and I have to sit to him across the table and talk to him for an hour or longer. And it's been fascinating. Um, it's, it's great having a president sit across you and you're able to ask them the tough questions. Sometimes you run the risk of going, being too respectful and like, and I did that with Jacob Zuma, the former president. When I interviewed him, I think I was still young at the time and I just couldn't understand are you really gonna ask this guy tough questions? So I was very respectful and very calm. Whereas with President Cyril Ramaphosa, I've, I've grown and I can still be respectful and calm, but I'm still gonna ask you the tough questions. So it's, it's that whole irony of this young boy and here you are now from the village, but here you are with these powerful people across you and you're not even scared of them, but it comes with, I suppose, experience and, and the passion for that accountability that I spoke about earlier. A lot of people see the front end of your work. So they'll see you on television, they hear in the airwaves and radio. Uh, you've become a very uh, prominent contributor on 702 Land as well with your work. So a lot of people front face with that mm -hmm. and they don't always know the behind the scenes of like, you know, behind that interview, maybe you spent a solid two days preparing for that particular interview or sleepless nights, just trying to figure out certain things, doing your research. Take us through what it's like really being behind the scenes, you know, because I don't think a lot of people understand what sort of toll this job can give to one. So talk radio is difficult. Like it is, like you don't just get hired to come talk for three hours, you're hired to come and actually sound smart. Like people who listen to 702 know their business. We're talking to CEOs, we are talking to people who are well read, Sometimes we discuss topics that involve, and people who are experts in those topics are listening to us. So you need to know your story. That requires so much preparation. I over-prepare, I read a lot. Like I'm an avid reader because I love reading my books, fictions or whatever, yeah. but I also have to read a lot with work. Um, and that's really how you produce a good interview. I always say I wanna be an expert in whatever topic I'm going to tackle. If I want to interview Lennox, who is an economics in this, I'm going to go read so much that I want to know more than you, which is crazy because this is something you've studied, but that's the standard I set for myself. And I over prepare all the time. I don't want to be caught not understanding something. And of course, mistakes are going to happen, Yeah. but I prepare so much. So how I prepare for my show, it's three hours. Normally I'll spend about 
two and a half hours the night before, okay. just doing some reading and get preparing for the conversation I'm gonna have the next day. And then I get to work at seven o'clock every single morning. And then I continue with the preparation and then I'd have to read the newspapers because you need to know what's going on on the day. Um, and then you go on air. But there's a lot of work that goes into preparing for interviews. So if I'm gonna interview someone that I've not interviewed before, I go watch at least three interviews they've done because I want to check their mannerism, their right. demeanor. How do they, do they take long to respond to questions? Do they get easily irritated when you ask the tough questions? So that by the time I come in, I'm already prepared. I won't be caught off guard. So when you're already fighting me about the questions, I already know that mm, I, I already anticipate that. So that's part of the way that I prepare for interviews. Because for me, it's like, I want to get the most for the listeners. It's not about wow. me. It's about getting you to account or getting you to share information that's crucial so that a listener walks away enriched exactly and then when it comes to tv obviously having started in you know uh, print and then gone to radio and then now being on tv a lot of people recognize you and they're like oh clement let's see from uh, i've seen you from tv or whatever how has that changed your life in any way so the funny thing is a lot of people actually recognize me from 702 oh, okay right and i've worked on tv for a long time i mean i've worked on etv did a breakfast show there i've worked on enca on newsroom africa you know, now on the SABC. But a lot of people who recognize me are always like 702, which is weird because that's radio. Yeah. People don't know my face, they hear me. <laughs> so I guess people Google a lot of, of, yeah. of, of what we look like now, um, but also they see obviously on the websites, etc. People always ask me, what's the one thing you don't like about your job? And it's the fact that I get recognized. <laughs> almost everywhere where I go. Yeah. Um, but I also say that with humility because I know people come to you because they, you know, they love your job, your work, you know, they come give you feedback. And I appreciate that. But I am a very shy person. I am incredibly shy. And, and people find it weird because I work on television, I work on radio, I'm speaking to thousands of people every day. All right. But I'm really shy. So yeah, it's, it's that. And I was on stage with Adele recently, yes, which has yes. just made it worse. Yeah, so uh, that it's was made it incredible, worse. wasn't it? It was, it was amazing. It was on my birthday. I was in Munich, Germany, and Adele just picked me to come on stage. And you said it wasn't planned, actually, because uh, I mean, people thought that somebody like, you know, but it was like really just No, it was, it, was, it was destiny. And I'm a shy person. So it was, it was quite interesting, but what a beautiful moment. I'm so appreciative of that. With broadcasting, you know, you start off in one section, you transition to the next role, you transition to the next gig, and everything is new and sometimes it's different, and sometimes you getting into somebody's show or filling in somebody's boots who was pretty a prominent figure in that particular show, and now you have to bring your own personality to, to the new opportunity. What have you sort of learned about finding your voice, um, understanding who you are, and sort of like accepting yourself and saying, well, this is Clement, and this is how I'm gonna be doing broadcasting. Yeah. Like you mentioned earlier that you were a little bit tough at the beginning and you realized, well, that's not really how you, you go about things. But what is it that allowed you to unlock the keys to really embrace yourself on air and just let the listeners enjoy you for who you are? The mistake I made was in the beginning was I've always wanted to be like other broadcasters. You know, so broadcasters that I looked up to. So I loved Kolani Gwala. Yeah. You know, this is someone I looked up to and I was like, oh, I'm gonna take his style of broadcasting. And then I used to listen to CBS Makaiza a lot, whom I took over from um, the 9 to 12 show on 702. And I was like, oh, I'm going to take his tough interviewing style. But you realize at some point that you are overcompensating. That's never going to work. And yeah. you're never going to have listeners that find you relatable. And radio is about relatability. Listeners want the real you. If you're not going to give them the real you, you're not going to make it in radio. And that's, that's a lesson I had to learn that you need to be yourself. You need to find your own way of doing things. And that really is what I attribute where I am now with, with my broadcasting, is that I was able to just be me. Be me with my experiences, be me with my style of questioning. Um, and I think it's important for me, that's a lesson I've taken that it's important that we just, we are the best, we can only be the best version of ourselves. If I wanna be like Lennox, I will never beat you at being you. Yeah. You know, you are perfect at being you and you can only be perfect at being yourself. And there's so much power that comes with embracing who you are and how you do things because 
In our world of broadcasting, that's what listeners actually appreciate. And, and a lot of knowing who you are has a lot to do linked to like your self-esteem. Yeah. And how do you make sure that you don't attach your self-esteem to your accomplishments? Because you know, if you're having like a bad you know experience with like things, then that could hit, take a hit on your self-esteem. So how do you make sure that you keep those things distinct? Look, um, in in the business that we do, you are going to have bad shows. Sometimes you're not going to have shows at all. So if you attach your self-esteem to to your work, that's not going to work for you in the long term. I don't, I don't do that. Um, I think I try separate the two. Um, I don't want work to define me because I'm more than my work, right. right? Like I'm more than the guy who asks the tough questions. I'm more than a guy who talks about current affairs, who's passionate about politics. Um, I'm a golfer. I love running. I love Formula One. I'm good at table tennis. I love poetry. I love pool table. I love traveling the world and seeing different cities and, and countries. So the, I love music shows. So there's so much of me that is outside of work. So when stuff doesn't go well at work, I still have me. You know, um, when stuff with me doesn't go well, I still have work because funny thing is my work does li- really uplift me. Yeah. Sometimes I wake up and I've got things that I'm dealing with. The minute I switch on that mic and I speak to the listeners, oh, it's, I don't know how to explain that feeling. And that's why in radio, I always refer to them as family, you know, the people I talk to every single day. Because even when I'm just talking to them and they're listening, I feel that presence and I feel their care. So the two complement each other, uh, but you can't embrace one more than the other. Yeah, with your work, it makes you a, a thought leader, an expert in the field. And I'm sure a lot of people ask you for their, your, their opinion around certain issues. But if I was to ask you, if you were to be the president, for instance, one day, how would you go about reshaping the course of the country? Whew, I'm glad I'm not the president <laughs> because that's a difficult job. Um, but. There are a number of things. So I will answer that question based on what I'm passionate about. Right. right? I'm passionate about justice and accountability, as I said. One of the things I would make sure is there is accountability for corruption, um, especially for public officials that are doing corruption. How do you make sure of that? Is just make sure there's enough money to fund law enforcement agencies. You know, crime intelligence is underfunded. Yeah. How are we going to solve crime in this country when we don't have informants? Our informants are complaining that they're not even being paid enough money anymore. And they're not going to risk their lives and come and say, oh, we know of a gangster who lives across the road, right? Make sure that you fund the NPA so that they can hire, you know, good prosecutors who are well experienced. And when you've got good prosecutors who are well experienced, they get into court, they don't bungle cases. They go, they argue hard, they send people to jail. Um, And for me, that's the first thing that I would look at. But I think the second thing I would look at is, because I'm passionate about education as well, is I would make sure that we somehow change our curriculum to reflect the history of this country and reflect it correctly in the history of this continent. I just feel our curriculum, um, we have been told stories of even the transition of this country that I don't think has been too honest. I don't think we have shared the story of the resilience of Africans and the people of this continent enough. I think people need to know our history. Um, They need to know where we come from. They need to know why things are the way they are now, because that has a bearing also on where we come from. And they need to learn from the lessons um, and the mistakes that we made in that ruthless regime so that we can move forward as a non-racial, as a country where people just get along. But that's going to start with us acknowledging what happened, appreciating what happened, the consequence of that in today. Um, and that, and through that, we're going to move forward. So those are the, some of the things I would yeah. do. Yeah, true accountability champion you are. And Clement, you've had now nearly four to five years. I think uh, next year will be your fifth year at uh, Radio 702 on the mid-morning show from I'm 9 sure. to 12. Yeah. Uh, as you reflect and also as you think about your success in television, coming from ETV mm-hmm. to ENCA to Newsroom Africa, now to the SABC, I mean, what's up for you next? What, what are some of the things you would like to achieve in the next sort of like five to 10 years? So the weird thing is, I never even regard what I'm doing as success because I don't even think I've reached my peak yet. Yeah. I'm too far from my peak. Um, the way I've dreamt, I'm, I'm a big dreamer. I consider what I'm doing now as really entry level yeah. 
in my career. Um, I want to do, I, may, I still want to do big things, man. Um, I'm, I'm currently doing, you know, producing some shows. That's a passion that I picked up late last year. I realized that I get hired by production companies to come host shows. Yeah. And I end up doing the behind the scenes work. So I'm not just a presenter, but I end up being involved in producing some shows. So what I'm doing now is I conceptualize shows. Okay. You know, I go get, you know, try get funding, get sponsors, you know, and then pitch the shows to channels. And I enjoy that so much. So you're going to be seeing a lot of the television shows, you know, on different platforms that I have co-produced, um, that I've, or that I've um, co-conceptualized. So that's a, that's the next phase of what I'm looking forward to. Um, but also I'm, you know, I'm launching the, my foundation that is going to focus on just uplifting children from, especially these far flung areas. So I come from a village where we didn't even have career guidance. I didn't know what I wanted to do yeah. when I finished grade 12. I didn't because we've never had people come to um, our school and sort of check our interests and say, these are the options that are available for you guys. And I know this is a reality for a lot of schools in villages. And I want to help change that. You know, I want to take, because I've made contacts throughout my career in broadcasting. Right? Yeah. I know CEOs of banks. I've had a relationship with them. I know TV producers. I know actors. I know artists. I want to leverage that, take them to these areas, accountants, doctors, and say, these are the options. These are the things you can do. What questions do you have for these people? And we underestimate yeah. the importance of young people from grade 10 even, at least knowing what they want to study. A lot of people sometimes don't even go to university because, oh, I didn't know what to apply for. Yeah, that's that's right. bad. And I see it a lot in these village, in these village of far flung areas. And I want to change that. I want to work with organizations that are going to bring in people that will help grade 12 learners, grade 10 learners have an idea of what they can study. So that's another thing I'm doing with, with my foundation. Yeah, that's exciting. Um, I've got a thousand things I want to do, but in a <laughs> nutshell, that's some of the things I'll, I'm really focusing on in this near future. If you were to go out and take somebody out, a prominent figure, who would you invite that you would maybe perhaps want to take to a restaurant or maybe play golf with? Um, somebody on your radar. Someone on the radar. So, so the person that I would love to have a conversation with is, funny enough, Donald Trump. Okay. Like, I would want to take Donald Trump, and I've had the opportunity to play golf at his golf course in LA, which is the best golf course I've ever seen ever in the world. I would like to take him on a golf course and have a conversation with him, maybe even an interview during the golf course. Like, what's going on? Like, hey, Clement, <laughs> I watch your show. You You're know, a great I guy. I don't know. You what know, you say? Fake news. <laughs> <laughs> this is fake news. But you have some nice questions today, yeah. right? <laughs> I would like to talk to Donald Trump. This is a journalist in me. Yeah. The human in me, yo, I'd like to sit down with Petrus Mutsipe. Interesting. Or yeah. Evan Koza. I mean, I've interviewed many of these guys already, but if I'm here, I'm to do dinner. Like those are the, like Michelle Obama. I yeah. have to sit down with it, Michelle Obama. Yeah, the, the human side of me would like to have dinner with people where it's not an interview, it's nothing tough. It's just us also learning because I love learning a lot from people. Um, you know, Will Smith. Yeah. I mean, I've read his book. I've read his wife's book. That's how much I love the Smith family. I've actually had a dream where Will Smith invited me to his house. Oh. <laughs> It's That's never cool. going to happen, yeah. but I'm going to hold on to that dream. Uh, you he's know, one of the people I admire a lot. I love his work ethic. I love, just love how full of life he is. And I, you know, when you understand Will Smith's journey and where he comes from and the struggles he's faced, you'll appreciate him more as an artist, but also as a family man, because you know his story. And, and if I do a dinner with anybody else, it's more about... Tell me about your journey. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just learning absorbing from all of that. And just absorbing that. I'm, I love learning from people. You're a lifelong learner. And when, you, when you're at Tux, the University of Pretoria, mm -hmm. doing your Bachelor of Arts, uh, I think you graduated 2013. Yes. And now you're busy with your uh, postgraduate at the business school. I mean, what's, what comes to mind? What are some of the things that you think about with, from your experience back in the day at Tux and currently now at the Gibbs campus? Yo, tax was such a learning experience for me. So, you know, I, I always say, even I share this with my listeners as well, that for the first time I saw like, you know, 
white people like that at Tux. Yeah. Or even had a white teacher where we were just talking English the whole time. I didn't have that growing up. Like we were talking, we had teachers who taught us English in Sibedi. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> it was crazy. Yeah. And when you get to Tux, it was such a great learning curve and I'm so appreciative. It's a, it's an institution that's so close to my heart because I made amazing friends there. Yeah. Um, I, my love for journalism as I was studying journalism at Tux, that's where it really grew. Like in my second year, that's when, or third, that's when I realized that, oh my God, I'm actually passionate about this thing. I'm not just studying it to get a job. I'm doing it because I feel like it's actually a calling. I mean, I had my, lect my former lecturer at Tux, came, is now, she's now a consultant. Um, uh, she's been working at UCT. She came to 702 to come do something, research with our eyewitness news team. Oh, right, awesome. And it was such a beautiful moment to see her. She came to say hi to me. And I was like, this is a woman I've not seen since 2012. Um, and for me, for us to unite again under these different circumstances was so cool. And she was just one of the best teachers. So yeah, it was, it was lovely. I love Tux for that. It was just a melting pot of, I mean, today I've got people I know who are at the SABC, people I know who are great journalists, people I know who are great in PR, you know, people I know who have gone to be great chartered accountants. And these are all people who were at at, at Tux. So it was a place for friendship for me, but a place for learning as well. There's, there's so much I had to get accustomed to, but the environment was just so welcoming and so easy, um, and it made it so much fun. So that's why yeah. I didn't want to go anywhere else but Gibbs right. when I'm doing my postgrad, yeah, given the link that yeah, the link. with the University of Pretoria. Yeah, yeah that's awesome, Clement. Well, we'll probably be safe, safe to say catch you at graduation uh, when you graduate. And, all the, and obviously for the listeners, you can always catch, uh, catch Clement on, uh, on the airwaves as well as on your television screens. Thank you so much for Thank joining so us today much, on the Leadership Podcast. You've shared so much about your life and uh, we appreciate that. Thank you. This was fun. That brings us to the end of our chat with Clement Bagnatella. Truly inspiring as he's certainly using his uh, talents and gifts to make a difference in the world. And uh, you remember that you can catch the podcasts on all platforms. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, as well as on YouTube, or wherever you consume your content. Remember to find more information at up.ac.za forward slash leadup. You'll get more information and find other episodes that we've recorded in the past. And uh, remember that this product is a proud production of the University of Pretoria's Alumni Relations Office. Our production team includes Samantha Castle, who is head of content, and Alna Schutz, and our sound engineers are Maropa Productions. We're bringing you the great audio visual quality uh, that you're enjoying right now. But for now, it's nothing but love and light. <laughs>